call to, our call to worship today is from 1 Timothy 1, one of our lectionary readings for the day. To the King of all ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. And let's sing our praise to God as I invite you to stand with me, if you're able, to sing our first hymn, O Worship the King, all glorious above. continue to praise and bring our praise and adoration in our prayers together. Let's pray. Living God, we give thanks for the many blessings you bestow on our lives. The greatest of these blessings is the way that in Christ you seek us out and offer us undeserved mercy and love. Such love enriches and enhances our lives in ways that knowledge never could and enables us to accomplish far more than we could ever dream or imagine. And so we worship and praise you, O oh God, for so blessing our lives, for your amazing love for us and for others that you have demonstrated to us throughout our lives. We bring our praise and thanks. Let's bring our prayers of confession to God. <clears throat> Lord God, we confess that often we have strayed away from your ways like lost sheep. We have disregarded your great care for us. Merciful God, your joy reflects a love so broad that it enfolds all people. A love that despairs when people, for whatever reason, lose their way in life and feel lost and rejected. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we may have been oblivious to the needs of others, or when we have failed to respond with love and compassion, when we've encountered needs that leave us feeling overwhelmed. We confess, Lord, that it's easier for us not to see the stranger, the refugee, the person in need. Forgive us, Lord, when we've withheld our greeting, our love, our response. For what we have left undone that we ought to have done, and for what we have done that we ought not to have done. Forgive us and restore us, we pray, that we may live in love and obedience. For your glory and praise, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The words of assurance of forgiveness. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And so we rejoice that in Jesus Christ we are found, we are forgiven, and we are loved. Thanks be to God. Now we have our, for our children's time, we've got... And let's come before God as we continue to praise and bring our praise and adoration in our prayers together. Let's pray. Living God, we give thanks for the many blessings you bestow on our lives. The greatest of these blessings is the way that in Christ you seek us out and offer us undeserved mercy and love. Such love enriches and enhances our lives in ways that knowledge never could and enables us to accomplish far more than we could ever dream or imagine. And so we worship and praise you, O oh God, for so blessing our lives, for your amazing love for us and for others that you have demonstrated to us throughout our lives. We bring our praise and thanks. Let's bring our prayers of confession to God. <clears throat> Lord God, we confess that often we have strayed away from your ways like lost sheep. We have disregarded your great care for us. Merciful God, your joy reflects a love so broad that it enfolds all people. A love 
that despairs when people, for whatever reason, lose their way in life and feel lost and rejected. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we may have been oblivious to the needs of others, or when we have failed to respond with love and compassion when we've encountered needs that leave us feeling overwhelmed. We confess, Lord, that it's easier for us not to see the stranger, the refugee, the person in need. Forgive us, Lord, when we've withheld our greeting, our love, our response. For what we have left undone that we ought to have done, and for what we have done that we ought not to have done. Forgive us and restore us, we pray, that we may live in love and obedience. For your glory and praise, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The words of assurance of forgiveness. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And so we rejoice that in Jesus Christ we are found, we are forgiven, and we are loved. Thanks be to God. Thanks. Kids, I'm just going to pray for you before we, you go off to our Christian learning and you can all sit down. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our children and thank you that you love each one of them, each one of us in this congregation, each person in the world. You extend your love. Thank you that you know us and love us and care for us. Help us to remember that you're forever with us. Amen. Okay, thanks. Have a good time at um, Christian Learning. And we're going to hear our scripture readings now. And Di is going to bring those to us. Thanks, Di. Kids, I'm just going to pray for you before we, you go off to our Christian learning and you can all sit down. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our children and thank you that you love each one of them, each one of us in this congregation, each person in the world. You extend your love. Thank you that you know us and love us and care for us. Help us to remember that you're forever with us. Amen. Okay, thanks. Have a good time at um, Christian Learning. And we're going to hear our scripture readings now. And Di is going to bring those to us. Thanks, Di. The first reading comes from 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 17. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. And the second reading, Luke 15, 1-10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which of you, which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, 
does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The first reading comes from 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 17. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy, because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. And the second reading, Luke 15, 1 to 10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which of you, which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I think we need to go on a few more slides. Ah, these lost parables. They're some of my favourites. I like it when these um, passages of scripture come up. Um, of course, they're parables about love, amazing love, really. And this reading in the parable Jesus told highlights how important each person is to God. Indeed, the whole chapter fleshes out the words of John's Gospel. And I'm sure you all know that God so loved the world that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. The whole reason for Jesus' existence in the world was simply because God loved the world. God so loved. He loves the world and today's reading organises the world into you and me and in fact anyone, whoever, is lost. Now the distinctiveness about these verses is that God seeks us out in our lostness, in our brokenness. And the illustrations used by Jesus highlight the extent of God's love. The original words from Luke's Gospel were addressed to a crowd of people who would have ranged from the top of the social scale of the day right down to the very bottom. The opening verses stated, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. The Pharisees were regarded as the elite in the community. And the tax collectors and sinners, of course, were seen as the despised. So the original hearers of these parables were a very diverse group of people, the whole scale of people. And we heard in the reading that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law grumbled, grumbled. 
And they said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Therefore, the choice of people described in these parables, the choice of people that Jesus chose to illustrate, is extremely important. Because the principal characters that Jesus chose are shepherd and a woman. That's significant. Because these were people extremely low down on the social scale in the eyes who drew, of those who drew up the scale itself. The very people who should have known God's love knew no bounds. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law. These were the ones who were supposed to know about God. But they were too ready to draw rigid boundaries around their belief as to who could be the recipients of God's love. We have to be very careful as God's people that we hear these words addressed to us also. That we need to be wary that we don't draw those comparable boundaries which might only include people who look like us, live like us, think like us. And Jesus begins this first parable with a question about shepherding. As he's addressing these people, he says, which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Now at first, these parables sound quite straightforward, don't they? A shepherd loses a sheep and a woman loses a coin. And when they find their missing items, they call all their friends, invite them to come and celebrate the return of that which was lost because now they found it. And our familiarity with this parable may prevent us from noticing the absurdity of Jesus' question. He begins when he talks about this shepherd losing a sheep. He says, which one of you? Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one who is lost? Well, the answer is, which one of you? None of you. Nobody would do that. No one would be crazy enough to abandon 99 sheep and leave them in the wilderness for the sake of one. Jeopardize the entire flock leave them at the mercy of wild beasts just to look for one? Now I have to tell you that one of my uh, parents' favourite songs that we listened to lots in our family home was a beautiful song by George Beverly Shea that started there were 99 that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. Does anybody remember that song? No, a few people, yeah. Well, sorry. It's all wrong because the text says that he leaves them in the wilderness. He didn't leave them safely at all. They weren't safely lay in a shelter of a fold. He left them in the wilderness. What a stupid idea to leave 99 sheep to go and look for one. No, it doesn't make sense. It's economic madness, if nothing else. But this is how valuable each one is to God. That's what Jesus is trying to say. This is how valuable. This is the nature of God's shepherding. He's a crazy shepherd because he'll go after the one. What about the woman who loses one coin? Have you ever lost something and you search and search and search and you rack your brain, you retrace your steps, you check every drawer, every cupboard, behind every cupboard, under the bed, under the cushions in the couch. John? <laughs> Nothing. Eventually, driven crazy with frustration, you give up. Saying, I cut, it'll turn up, it'll, it'll turn up sometime. You done that? Anybody done that? We've all done that, haven't we? But not this woman. She's a picture of persistence. Frustration doesn't stand in her way. She doesn't tire from looking. The text says she searches until she finds it. 
And that is how God is with us. Persistent. Do you see what Jesus is trying to demonstrate with this shepherd and with this woman? And in Jesus' day, because a shepherd's job took him out in the fields when he should have been in the synagogue, and the nature of his work caused him to not only work on the Sabbath, but to do quite mundane, dirty things, he was usually despised by those who exercised religious authority. And as for the woman, she was even further down the scale of acceptable persons. She was a woman. And yet here was Jesus saying, this is how God acts, like this shepherd, like this woman, persistently seeking out the lost and celebrating when they're found. The parable is teaching the hearers something of God's nature, something of the nature of God's kingdom. This radical new kingdom which Jesus is ushering in. And it's about the joy of the kingdom. He says, and when the shepherd finds the sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. And of the woman who finds the lost coin, he says, And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. But these religious people had truly lost the plot. They were missing the purpose of the kingdom and missing the joy and celebration of the kingdom. And Jesus says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Now for those folk who hold an understanding of God as one who sits off at a distance, removed from people, and who judges with vengeance, these lost parables present a vastly different picture of God. Here we see God is portrayed as actively seeking out those who were lost, those who had separated themselves off from God for one reason or another. And in the epistle, our reading from uh, First Timothy, we have the end result of God's seeking and saving attitude. Paul speaks with gratitude of the mercy that was extended to him, even though he was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, he says. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the very worst, Paul says in his letter to Timothy. And in many ways, in our humanity, we are all lost until we find our purpose in God. I wonder if you can locate just where you are in each of these accounts about God's activity in the world. Do we experience God as a distant deity, withdrawn from our experience? Or do we yearn to be found? Are we celebrating the fact, like Paul, that we have been found? And that's what God's amazing grace is. The love that actively seeks us out when we feel confused, alone, frightened, or if we strayed away from God for whatever reason, being it our own fault, the fault of others, or no one's fault at all. The good news of the gospel today is that God is seeking each one of us. Seeking me, seeking you, because we, you, are valuable to God. Valuable. Don't we all need to feel valuable in this life? And we find our value in God, who loves us more than we can imagine. That's why it's called Amazing Love. And each Sunday is a time when we come together with thanksgiving, of gratitude, that we've been touched by God's grace, that we know he's working in our lives. 
Let's pray that our response to that amazing grace is a renewed commitment to see all people as God sees them, valuable. And let's pray that we continue the work of Jesus who came to seek and to save the lost. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as you're able as we sing that hymn, Amazing Grace. to God's love and grace in our lives is that we bring something from our lives, our offering to God. Many of us give through direct debit, but there's opportunity now for those of you who have offering today to bring them forward here to the front and as we receive our offering in response to God's love and grace to us. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you with great thanks and praise for all that you do for us, and we bring our offering. In no way can we repay who you are or what you've done for us, but we bring these gifts today, wanting to participate with you in your love and grace in our world. And so we pray that the gifts that we bring will be used to extend that good news of your love to all people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to our prayers for ourselves and others today, um, I'm sure you're conscious of the amazing events that have been happening throughout the world um, with the, um, the death of Queen Elizabeth II. And, um, the declaration of King Charles III. And so this is something that's affected not just our Britain or the Commonwealth countries, but people throughout the world are responding. And, um, and we too um, will come today with prayer um, for this situation. I have a prayer that um, our moderator, Reverend Andrew Gunton, has prepared and we'll have this prayer today. So let's pray. Loving God, as we come to you this day, we give thanks for the life of Her Royal Highness, Queen Elizabeth II. We thank you that she was baptised into the Christian faith and lived out that baptism in a life of service to you, demonstrated so visibly through her long life of service as Head of the Commonwealth. We thank you that for her this service was built on the promises of Christ and the hope she had in his reconciliation of the whole of creation. Gracious God, we ask that you embrace her family at this time. Surround her son, King Charles III, his family, her other children and their families with your loving arms, allowing them to rest assured of your promises that death is not the end, and that eternal salvation is assured for us through the victory that Christ won over the grave. Merciful God, as the people around the world come together in our common sense of grief and loss, may we too find that sense of hope in the resurrection glory of Christ. May we all move forward together knowing that as we celebrate the Queen's life of service and faithfulness, that we too are called to live our own lives in your loving care and committed service. May we be inspired to work together for the betterment of this world, taking the example of the Queen's faithfulness to the good news of Jesus. And may we be strengthened to continue to love and serve you all the days of our lives. We pray especially today for King Charles III, even as his monarchy is declared in Australia today. We pray for him for wisdom, for sensitivity, for humility and for love. And we pray that he will know your presence with him. And we pray this in the name of Christ. 
Amen. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we continue to rejoice in the love that God has for each one of us, and knowing that we're all valuable to him, let's respond as we sing this final hymn. I invite you to stand with me as you are able. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Let's sing together. to give you a benediction, I invite you now to remind each other of this good news, that we are loved and we are valuable to God. We are loved, we are valuable. Would you turn to those either side of you, if behind you, and say, you are loved, you are valuable. Let's say that to each other. And you are we need reminding. We need reminding. And now we go out into this week, into our lives as we have them, and let's share that love that we know, that value that we know with those around us. Let's use eyes that see God's love for all people that we meet. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us and go with us now and forevermore. Amen. And so our final our benediction song is, May the feet of God walk with you, and may you know in walking with you. Let's sing together.